Good morning, church. So good to have you on this Sunday school lesson as I am uh, coming to you from a uh, different location. I am actually in the children's uh, children's church room where we have all kinds of fun backgrounds here. We have uh, our bulletin board. We have um, Pastor Christina's ongoing lesson. We have all the fun stuff. And there's Christina working in the corner, so you might hear her too. But uh, we're hanging out together, so I am bringing you this Sunday School from this location uh, so that we can learn together in God's Word and continue our monthly unit on creation. Uh, before we jump in, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll um, go to the text, which is Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask that you empower us, give, enlighten us. May your words speak into our lives that we may live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, today, Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Uh, uh, my, my hope is that you've read the lesson. Many of you at home uh, already have the lesson and you've read it, so I'm not going to repeat the lesson. But what I am going to do, uh, this is the story of God uh, making, <coughs> excuse me, making Eve out of Adam, and um, and the drama of Adam being alone and then having a, a helpmate and a partner. What I'd like to do is I'd like to read through the scripture because the scripture is so packed with inspirational and theological information that if you really don't understand Genesis, it's hard to understand almost the rest of the, the, rest of the Bible. I mean, Genesis, Abraham's call... The Exodus story and the law uh, really inform the rest of the Bible, even Jesus' own lessons. If you don't have a good groundwork of, of what's going on in creation, the, the uh, Eden, sin and the fall, and God's uh, redemption, plan of redemption, and then Exodus where God frees God's people, and, um, and the law, it's really even almost hard <clears throat> to understand Jesus' own ministry. So... Um, so we're going to jump in here, Genesis 2, 18 through 25. If you recall last week, um, I mentioned that the creation story in chapter 2 is different than chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we see creation from a heavenly point of view. In chapter 2, we see it from a more earthly point of view. There are details, there are some details that are actually a little different than chapter 1, and very minor details, but it gives you kind of a uh, a very specific, intimate picture of God participating in creation to form the animals, the plants, and all living things, and of course, the man, uh, which is uh, uh, Adam, the man. <clears throat> so let's pick it up, and we'll talk about the rest of the text. Chapter 2, verse 18, and we're going to just take it apart and let that be our lesson. Chapter 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. We see here that God sees that even though man is a steward over creation, naming the animals, working with the animals, uh, that the animals may be of the same essence or substance, but not the same likeness, that there's something missing with the animals that just uh, doesn't cut it for the man. <clears throat> and those of us who have pets know the importance of animals in our life, but certainly... There's no replacement for another person. And so what God does is, is comes up with this um, solution in which he says, I will make him a helper as a partner. Two words are very important, helper or helpmate and partner. Both of those words speak to the co-equal part of this, next, this other human. Helpmate is an important word because it's one who comes alongside another. It's too often when we read creation, and especially when a lot of pastors preach on creation, They'll use helpmate in a subordinate way, that Adam was created first and then Eve. And so because that subordinate helpmate is somehow subordinate. But in the original language of Eden, before sin entered the world, they were co-partners, co-equals. In fact, in other parts of the Bible, God is described as a helpmate of Israel. And of course, we would never say that God is subordinate to Israel, but God is a helpmate to Israel. God walks alongside Israel, brings Israel uh, to the fruition of his purposes, aids Israel in, in, uh, in fulfilling the call that Israel has. So a helpmate and partner, both of those words point to an equal, a co-equal uh, creation in which these two individuals will walk alongside each other in an intimate way. 
supporting one another and encouraging one another. The, the fact of the matter is they don't really, they're equal until the fall, and then only in the fall does God say uh, that um, woman would um, serve the man or, or be a delight to the man. It's, it's not really serve as in submit or servant, but uh, the idea that there is going to be a competition between the two of authority. And so what happens is in the fall, the, the part of the, the, da- the fall and their vulnerability is rather than working together and walking alongside each other, men and, women will, men, and, men and women will compete with one another for authority and headship. And of course, that becomes an issue throughout history, even today, in, in some relationships, until you get to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes, Jesus reinstates the equality of, of men and women in leadership and ministry and and reinstates that redemptive purpose that God had. That's why in Galatians 3, Paul says that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. God breaks down ethnic lines. There is neither slave nor free. God breaks down economic disparity, uh, economic uh, inequalities and disparities. And there is neither male nor female. That doesn't mean that men, men and women don't play specific roles. What Paul is getting at is, is through Christ and Christ's redemption, we return to that Edenic Eden, that, that ideal purpose that God had in which people come alongside one another. Elsewhere in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, uh, Paul says that there are roles that women and men play. And those roles, again, are co-equal, but they have specific ways in his culture in which men and women served the church so that people would come to Christ and not be distracted uh, by the, the different um, ways that men and women in Christ's community were coming together as, as equal partners in ministry. Uh, you read uh, books like 1 Corinthians, um, women and men pray and prophesy. There's a co-equal ministry. You read the book of Acts, uh, when Pentecost, the Spirit comes. Um, the Spirit restores men and women, our sons and daughters, to, to engage in ministry. But what happens is when these things happen, some of the pagans in the world that they were trying to convert got distracted by this equality and so Paul says in Timothy and um, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 13 that even though they're equal in Christ, um, they still need to continue in their roles, and masters need to continue in their roles, and children need to continue in their roles, and so on and so forth, in order to bring others to Christ and discover and experience Christ without getting distracted. But in the church, even in the early church, men and women had co-equal parts because Jesus reinstituted this original purpose in which God sees that people should not be alone and that God creates helpmates, supporters, partners in order for us to do what God has asked us to do. The other thing about this is helpmate is not necessarily in, in um, um, terms of marriage. A helpmate, again, is is a, a one who comes alongside. So we have abused this language by creating a subordinate role uh, for, for many people. And we've abused it by sexualizing this language, by saying that helpmate uh, points to marriage when really God's intention is for all of us to be helpmates one to another. But for now, in Eden, there are only two people. So that picture of man and woman, if you go back to Genesis 1, which remember I said creation in Genesis 1 gives us a, a large picture of creation. This is the details, but if you go to creation 1, there's a large picture, male and female, he created them in God's image. He God created them, meaning male and female together as a whole, portray the totality of who God is, the relational totality, as well as the totality of all of that makes men and women unique and special and, and the same, uh, all uh, reinforce who God is and the totality uh, of that relationship. So again, Genesis 2 gives us a little bit of a more detailed picture with a sequence But it's the totality of these two coming together as partners that really stress God's image as God is the the Trinity working three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit working together in a totality in a relationship. All right, that's a lot for verse 18, but that's where most of the meat is as far as I'm concerned. So let's keep reading. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called every creature, what that was its name. The man gave names uh, to all the cattle and to the birds of the field and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was 
uh, not found a helper as his partner. There's that language again. So one of the interesting things is the animals, there, there's, there are two differences. There's a qualitative difference. They're animals. But the other thing is the man names the animals. In the ancient world, when you name something, you are wielding power over it. That's why it is forbidden for Israelites to say God's name, because if the Israelites in the, old, in the olden days say God's name, they are wielding power over God. So it was forbidden to say God's name. So uh, we, we, the word Yahweh, which is the Hebrew word for God, um, it literally means I am. It's not really a name. It's, it's more of a designation. So to name something is to wield power over it, to put it in its place. Again, this becomes important because when God creates woman, um, the, the naming is one of equality. And we'll get to that. But it's interesting because the animals just don't do. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord took had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called, notice it's not named, it's called woman, for out of the man this one was taken. Now, with the calling of this one woman, Adam is differentiating who she is. She's different, but he is not naming her again, because to name someone is to wield power over them, to put them in a subordinate place. And only until the fall and sin enters the picture and God punishes Adam and Eve, then after that, when the co-equal relationship between Adam and Eve are disjointed by sin, only then does Adam name the woman Eve. But now he just calls her woman to designate that she's different. She's not a man. She is a woman. Man, the Hebrew word for man is ish. The Hebrew word for woman is Isha. So he says, for out of Ish came Isha. Ish and Isha are two are the same word, same root word, with a little differentiation because obviously the woman is, is different. But he doesn't name her. He calls her to, to, to set her apart as, a, as not only a, an, an identification, but also in celebration of who she is. Finally, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You notice again, it points to the equality of the relationship. Not a subordinate, not an animal, uh, an equal, a partner, a helpmate, bone of bones, flesh of flesh, ish and isha. Only until sin enters the world does, uh, does Adam name the woman Eve. Very important. You don't get this, it's hard to get Jesus because the, the relationships that happen after Jesus are extremely important for the life of the church. It becomes a problem in some communities, as I mentioned earlier, because it distracted a lot of pagans who are not used to that equality uh, to coming to the Lord. So there had to be some, some accommodations for culture. As Paul says, uh, you accommodate culture. If uh, uh, He says, uh, in order to speak to the Greeks, I became a Greek. In order to speak to the Jews, I became a Jew. And in that conversation, he says, in order to reach people for Christ, we have to not distract them from the gospel. But as far as, as this relationship goes, it's important because it points to man and woman reflecting the totality of God's image. God, the relationship of the Trinity. God, Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. None of them are subordinate to one another. The Son is not subordinate to the Father. The Holy Spirit is not subordinate to the Father and the Son. They all are co-equal partners. And it's in that relationship that gives birth to the totality of God's image in Ish and Isha, man and woman. So there's celebration. Uh, there is, for the first time, the, the man speaking out loud. We have some dialogue for the first time here uh, uh, coming from the man's lips, and it's, it is dialogue of praise uh, and of celebration for, uh, for woman. Um, in verse 24 and 25 are, are editorial amendments to the text. And what I mean by that is you hear now the editor or the writer coming in and saying, oh, by the way, this is why marriage is so important. So let's read verse 24 and 25 as we sum up. Therefore, the man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So this is kind of a, a summation 
to this part of the text. Let's take it piece by piece. Verse 24. Therefore, the man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. This, this idea of clinging, again, we, we think in terms of marriage and, and sexual intimacy, but again, clinging is a partnership. There are other places in Scripture in which God clings to Israel. Um, when, when the Scripture talks about the relationship between David and Jonathan, this language is used. David and Jonathan are best friends. They cling to one another. So again, we've, we've looked at these, this Scripture from, from our point of view of, of marriage and intimacy, but again, the clinging is, is a coming together, one flesh, to reflect the totality of God. In this particular verse, marriage, but again, the clinging doesn't just apply to, to marriage. It can apply to any close relationship in which two equals, two partners, are walking alongside each other in order to fulfill God's purpose. And then verse 25 is the setup for the next section. Because you don't get verse 25, you don't get the fall and the importance of the sin to come. So verse 25 says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. It's very important because if there's no competition between them and they're co-equal partners, then there's no honor and shame. You see, not only in the ancient world was, was naming important and, um, and family important, but in the ancient world, honor and shame were how you discerned identity and value. If you didn't have honor, you were shamed in community, you were cast out. Or if you brought shame upon your family, you were doing something wrong. We don't understand that here in America. We don't really think in those terms. But in the ancient world, and even today, in the Middle East or in Asia, like places like China, honor and shame are very much determining values uh, in families. But because there's no competition, there's no honor and shame, they're both equal. So they're both vulnerable. They're both naked. And there is no shame and no honor because they weren't competing with one another. They were co-equal partners. Again, we'll talk more about the, the breakdown of that co-equal partnership in, in, the, in the fall, in God's uh, punishment, the consequences of the fall, and how the Adam and Eve uh, move forward after that. But they're not ashamed because they're not competing. There's no trying to one-up each other, honor, and, uh, and all that. And by the way, the, the consequences of the fall and, and Adam and Eve's sin, of course, are passed on to their children, Cain and Abel, in which both of them present an offering to the Lord. One is more honored than the other. There's competition between them. And what happens? That's when the first murder takes place, when Cain kills Abel, because there's competition between them. They're not co-equal partners living into what God intended for creation. Only until we get Jesus Christ and the falling of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, read Acts chapter 2, do we get a breakdown of the, the barriers and walls and competition between ethnicity, economic, and, and gender roles, in which all are, as Paul says in Galatians 3, one in Christ. If you don't believe me, read Acts chapter 2. And if you don't believe me then, read Galatians, the whole book, from start to finish, focusing on Galatians 3. It's a beautiful book that gives us a picture of what God intends for us to do as we unite together under the lordship of the totality of who God is, three persons in one, to do ministry on his behalf. As God clings to us and is a help made for us and walks alongside us as we walk alongside one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're catching us on YouTube, like, subscribe, leave a comment. We'd love to engage and dialogue with you. And we can't wait to see you on Sunday for church, either on campus or online.